just maple lumber that has a particular figure to it, or a distinctive visual pattern in the wood that makes it look like that it has three-dimensional waves or ripples running through the grain, and it's a really interesting effect, and especially when you look at the wood in different angles of light. So curly maple is not a particular type of tree. It's not a particular type of species. It's just a phenomenon or a mutation in the way that the tree grew, but it occurs in several types of maple as well as all kinds of species of wood. It can happen in white oak, red oak, ash, hickory, and some fancier woods like Hawaiian koa, et cetera, et cetera. But in maple, it's really common for it to occur in eastern redleaf soft maple. So trees grow with figure, especially where there's curves, bends, and even branches. So where there's bends in the tree, that's where the grain kind of collapses in and kind of accordions. And what you get is this really pretty effect in the wood. And that's also why you'll find very pretty figured grain around large knots and boards. So where there's knots, that's where things get really interesting in wood and you get awesome patterns and awesome figure. That's just kind of the good and the bad of knots. Anyway, like I said, curly maple can occur in several varieties of maple as well as other woods. We've got another video about seven types of maple that you might encounter when you go to buy hardwood lumber. If you need more of an overview about what's maple in general, I've got that video for you, go check it out. But today we're just gonna to stick to the phenomenon that is curly maple. There are also different names for curly figure and the variations that it can produce. You've got fiddleback, tiger stripe, flame, quilting, sometimes you might hear ripple maple. They're all kind of varieties on the curly maple theme. So the term curly maple is kind of an umbrella phrase or maybe a catch-all phrase that sort of covers all of those because they're all sort of variations on the same type of thing, which is that compressing in the grain that produces interesting ripples throughout the board. Now, fiddleback is the name to use specifically for curly maple that's found in quarter sawn lumber. In that type of cut, quarter sawn, it's the nature of curly figure to be really straight and thin, going right across the board, almost like corduroy stripes. It's very consistent. And since luthiers prefer to use quarter sawn material in the backs of violins and other instruments like guitars, the colloquialism get, that gets applied to it is fiddleback. And similarly, flame maple is just another specific variation of curly figure, and it's a more abstract shape that kind of looks like flames. Now there are a few things that you should expect when you're picking out or you're buying curly maple lumber. The first one's pretty obvious is that you're gonna find boards with varying degrees of figure throughout. That just means you're gonna need to be a little more intentional about arranging the grain of your boards for your project. Plus you're gonna have a little higher waste factor than normal. It's just the way it is. Plus, you know what? It's not unusual for a woodworker to take a wider board of curly maple that's got really good figure running down the edges, but really light figure running down the center. Rip that board and re-glue back together with the figure mated together so you get really intense figure concentrated together. That's not a bad technique. Now, a really unfortunate characteristic in curly maple is that it just doesn't like to stay very flat. Yeah, the figure in there injects a little more tension and the stuff just has a harder time staying flat. So the thing to do is to flatten your project parts, get them into assembly as soon as you possibly can, and that'll serve you well. You probably don't want to flatten your parts and then let it sit for a week or so. They'll probably go out of whack on you again. So assemble as soon as you possibly can. Another thing to know about it when you're working with curly maple is that when you plane it, whether it's machine planing or hand planing, the figure is really prone to chipping out. So there's a couple things that you can do about that. First is if you are machine planing, don't send it through straight, send your work piece through at a bit of an angle and that produces kind of a shearing cut and you get really great results that way. But an even better machine is a drum sander. That's a better tool for figured woods. Now with hand planing, it's the same principle. You wanna plane your work at as much of an angle as you possibly can. You don't wanna to go too straight. You go too straight, you're gonna get more chip out. That shearing angle is what you want. Plus you should also re-grind your bevel so it's about 50 degrees or as steep as you can possibly go. The steeper, the better results you're gonna get. It's harder to push through the work, but you get a much better result in figured woods. Yeah, there you go. So with curly maple, 
Yeah, you want to be taking really light cuts, angle that plane as much as you can, and then grind that bevel to about 50 degrees if you can. That's going to give you excellent results and won't tear out as much. Then after that, the tool to use is a card scraper, and that will really clean things up and give you a great surface that's ready for a finish. Yeah, look at that. And no chip out whatsoever, and it's just give, making that really, really smooth. There's nothing quite like a card scraper on curly maple. The card scraper is such a great tool for figured woods. There's probably 75,000 videos out there on how to sharpen that, how to use it. It's really easy to do. It's not hard at all. It's a great skill to learn, great tool to have. So what I've got here is a curly maple veneer applied to plywood. And I'm going to sand this to 320 grit. Now I chose a veneer because that will give us a nice consistent piece to test multiple finishes on. Just limiting that variable so that we can see the comparison on different finishes on really the same piece of wood. So here's what we're going to compare. First is D-Wax Shellac, and that's because I find that that's one of the best options when you want just a really clear finish that's not very yellow, that also makes the figure really dance all by itself. That's a really great option. Next thing is Armor Seal by General Finishes, largely because this is just a really popular finish. And you might be thinking, hey, what does that look like on Curly Maple? It is a really good option. It looks beautiful on Curly Maple. And then really one of my favorites is this Tongue Oil Varnish by Old Masters. It looks great on a lot of woods. It's really easy to apply, hard to mess this one up, and it kind of gives a nice warm color. Plus it's also mixed with a little varnish. There's some nice protection mixed in already. Boiled linseed oil is just another option that kind of gets you about the same look. It just doesn't have the varnish already mixed in. This you can buy at the hardware store, I think for under about 10 bucks or so. The tongue oil varnish is a little more expensive, but they're both great options that provide a little bit of a warm amber color and they really make the curly figure jump out. And the last one's going to be deft spray lacquer. Spray lacquer is just a really easy finish. It goes on super clear, but it does yellow over time. And it looks great on curly maple as well. Okay, so here's how these came out. Now, if your main priority in finishing a curly maple project was to make the figure look its best with the clearest finish possible, I'm gonna point you to D-Wax Shellac first. It's a really easy finish to apply that you can brush on, you can wipe it on, you can spray it on. Plus, you can also use that as a sealer coat first in case you wanted to do a different top coat that had different properties or more durability, okay? But in the end, it's really clear and it really makes the figure look fantastic. Now, the General Finishes Armor Seal looks pretty good on Curly Maple too. It doesn't quite have the same effect on the figure that D-Wax Shellac has. And it's also a little bit clearer, I mean, by a fraction of a shade. It's a nice choice if that's what you like to use. And then if you did kind of want more of an amberish finish, I'd point you to the Tongue Oil Varnish or the Boiled Linseed Oil. My preference is that tongue oil varnish because it is insanely easy to apply. Plus it's got that varnish already mixed in, so it's got that protection added in. Boiled linseed oil is not a bad option either. There are a handful of ways that you can also top coat that one. Either way, both of those give you that amberish color and make the figure really dance. Now the aerosol lacquer goes on really easily. It dries fast. It even went on pretty clear, although it's gonna yellow a little bit more over time. It just didn't quite have the same effect on the figure that any of these others did. So I'd say if you did like that type of finish, I'll go back to the D-Wax Shellac and say, put down a coat of D-Wax Shellac first and then top coat it with lacquer and it's gonna look great. So it does stand to reason that if your finish does have a little bit of color to it, it's gonna make the figure look just that much better. With that, we probably should, we should, we should talk about dyes real quick. Okay, you can color wood with a stain, you can color wood with a dye. Stains basically apply a pigment to the surface of the wood, whereas dyes really saturate wood fibers with color. That's the, that's the, that's the basics of the difference, okay? But long story short, curly figure responds way better to dye than it does stain. By example, this is a board with kind of mediocre figure. I can see there's a lot of it running across here, but man, when you apply a little bit of color to it, it just goes kaboom. I applied one coat of dye that was diluted 50%, and then I sanded it off, and then I applied one more coat of dye. 
And what that did was really color in the figure nicely without making the board too dark. Now, dyes come in all sorts of colors, plus like I said, you can dilute them, so you don't even need to go with a color that's this intense. But let me show you the comparison. Since this is just dyed, it needs a top coat, so we'll go ahead, we will apply that tongue oil of varnish to this side, and we'll also do it to this side, and we can see the difference. If you still got questions, post them below. We'll try to answer. Again, my name is Mark. I'm from Woodworker Source. We got three stores in Arizona. You can come visit us or you can visit us at our website, woodworkersource.com. We sell woods like this to people like you and ship it right to your door if you want to. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it.